Okay, so we're going to move on to the uh, second section all about nucleophilic substitution now. So you need to be on page eight of your note packs on this section here, which says nucleophilic substitution by cyanide ions. So again, I'm on a separate piece of paper, I'm going to explain how this process works. And then after that, look at nucleophilic substitution with ammonia. So pages eight and nine in your note pack. Okay, so we're going to look at the next stages of the nucleophilic substitution mechanism. Now, you need to know this nucleophilic substitution mechanism in three formats, and we've already done the first one. We've looked at nucleophilic substitution of a haloalkane using a hydroxide nucleophile. So that's the version we looked at in my previous, uh, previous video clip. Uh, and here I've just outlined an example using bromoethane and turning it into ethanol. Now, you also need to know the same mechanism, but with two other nucleophiles, one being a cyanide ion and another being ammonia. So I'm going to go through in this video clip how that um, mechanism is applied using both of those nucleophiles. One of them is really quite similar to this. The other is, uh, you know, has an extra sort of level of complication. OK, so let's look at the nucleophilic substitution using a cyanide ion to begin with. Now, it's worth mentioning to, uh, to start off with that the reagent here is potassium cyanide, KCN. When potassium cyanide dissolves in solution, it splits up into a K plus ion and a CN minus ion. So just like previously, the potassium ion is our spectator ion, we're just going to ignore that. And the cyanide ion, which has got a negative charge and a lone pair of electrons on the carbon, is going to be our nucleophile in this situation. So KCN is our uh, reagent, the CN minus ion is our nucleophile. Now, this example, I've got uh, bromoethane with a cyanide ion. It starts up in exactly the same way. My bromine is more electronegative than the carbon, so that results in delta plus and delta minus charges. And then the lone pair on our cyanide is going to be attracted to the delta plus carbon of our bromoethane. So that's my first mark in an exam. And then the lone, uh, not the lone pair, the bonding pair of electrons in that carbon to bromine bond both move over onto the bromine to turn it into a bromide. So our Two carbons stay the same and our five hydrogens stay the same. And then because the bromine has been kicked off and the CN group is added on, we end up with CN attached there and the Br- minus is floating off and that's what we call our leaving group. Okay, now a few kind of quirks of this mechanism if this one crops up in an exam. Firstly, let's look at naming our product. We've gone from a starting material which had two carbons in it, so we're starting off with bromoethane. Oops, scrappy writing, ethane, because it's two carbons. But now our product now has three carbons. And this is one of very few mechanisms where you can actually make the carbon chain of a molecule longer. So because it was eth, we've added a carbon on here. So we're now going to be calling our product something involving prope. And this group is called a nitrile group. It's called a cyanide group when it's on its own as an ion here. But when you attach it onto a chain, it's called a nitrile. So this is called propane nitrile. All one word, and you must have that e between the propan and the nitrile bit. The following would be marked incorrect in an exam. So you can't write propanitrile like that and sort of merge them together. So that would be incorrect. This one is correct. Propane nitrile with an E between the two. Okay. Um, the condition for this reaction, this one has to be in ethanolic conditions. So that means rather than dissolving it in water, we dissolve it in ethanol. And the equation, just like the example I went through last time, you can either use the equation involving the potassium or not involving the potassium. So I'm going to do it not involving it. So we're going to have CH3CH2Br plus our cyanide ligand, uh, not ligand, our cyanide ion. And that's going to make 
CH3, CH2, CN, and a bromide ion floating off on its own. When you're writing it as an equation like this, you can put the lone pairs on or you can miss them off. It doesn't really matter. In your, in your mechanism, you do have to share lone pairs. Um, right, one other thing I was going to mention about this product. If they ask you to draw this as a display formula, the carbon to nitrogen bond is a triple bond. So don't get caught out by that. A display formula is where you show every single bond going on within a molecule. So this carbon has a triple bond to the nitrogen, okay? So just watch out for that one. Okay, so what I'd like you to do, have a go at the following two examples, please. So I want chloromethane reacting with uh, potassium cyanide and one bromopropane reacting with potassium cyanide. So pause the video clip, have a go at drawing out the full mechanism for those two, please. Right, let's go through both of these. So again, always take care to make sure that you're starting off with the right uh, reagent, okay? Often people lose marks in an exam when they've drawn a you know, perfectly correct curly arrow mechanism, but they've done it on the wrong molecule. So if I'm starting off with chloromethane, meth means one carbon. So that's what I'm starting off with. And again, delta minus on the chlorine, delta plus on the carbon. Potassium cyanide, forget the potassium, we're just dealing with the cyanide bit, bit. so CN minus with negative charge and lone pair on the carbon. So, first curly arrow from the lone pair to that slightly positive carbon, and then once that's attacked, we break the carbon-chlorine bond, and that results in the formation of our product. just floats off and does its own thing. So we've gone from chloromethane, but then it has now got two carbons on it, so it's called ethane nitrile ethane with an E in that gap there. Okay, second example then, one bromopropane with potassium cyanide, so meth, eth, prop. If it's one bromopropane, it doesn't matter which end we start off with our bromine on, I'm just gonna put it here for now. And let's fill in all those gaps with hydrogens. So my cyanide ion is a CN minus negative charge, lone pair on the carbon. Again, you don't have to draw them on, but it's good practice to do delta minus on the bromine, leaving delta plus on the carbon because the bromine is more electronegative. The lone pair on that carbon attacks that slightly positive carbon there and that kicks off these electrons onto the bromine. So that is a mark on an exam. That is a mark on an exam. And then in terms of our product, one, two, three carbons for the three carbons that were there to begin with, but then the fourth carbon has been added on because of that cyanide group. Oh no, no bond there, ignore that. The bromine's been kicked off, so let's have a Br minus floating around. That goes off to do its own thing. So we've gone from meth eth prop, so one bromopropane, but this is now meth eth prop bute. So butane nitrile. Again, get the E in between the butan and the nitrile bit. Okay. Right, final variation of the nucleophilic substitution mechanism now then, and this is the nucleophilic substitution using ammonia. Now this mechanism does have similarities, but it also has quite a significant difference as well. So this is worth getting your head around. We've already looked at this mechanism using hydroxide ions and cyanide ions as our nucleophile. And if you just look, if you compare those two nucleophiles to the ammonia, which is what we're about to use as our nucleophile, the key difference is these nucleophiles have negative charges. This nucleophile doesn't have a negative charge. It's already a molecule. It's a reasonably stable molecule, but the nitrogen just so happens to have its own lone pair. And the, that causes the difference in the mechanism, which we'll encounter in a second. 
That lone pair still means it's attracted to slightly positive carbons, but it sort of has a, a knock-on effect that we'll, we'll look at now. So we're going to carry out this mechanism using chloroethane. So same deal as before. Chlorine is slightly negative, meaning the carbon is slightly positive. Our ammonia with its uh, lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen is going to attack that slightly positive carbon and then kick off the chlorine. So those are our first two marks in an exam. So now let's draw the next kind of stage in this process. So we've got the two carbons, which were on our uh, chloroethane to start off with. The five hydrogens are unaffected, so they're still there. And because it's a substitution mechanism, this ammonia has swapped places with the chlorine. So I'm now going to draw that here. So N bonded to its three hydrogens. Now, here's the issue. Normally, when we've looked at this mechanism before, this would now be our finished product, okay? If it was a hydroxide or a cyanide ion, the nucleophile would attack, we'd kick off our halogen, and we've got to our product. Here we have not so. And the reason is, at nitrogen, only ever forms three bonds, okay? Or it, it would want to form three bonds. And here we've forced our nitrogen to form a fourth bond. As it happens, this bond here is in fact a, a coordinate bond or a dative covalent bond because both the electrons have come from the nitrogen to bond with that carbon. So you could represent it like that if you wish. Now, this nitrogen is not very happy in this situation. In fact, because it's donated two electrons into this bond, whereas typically in a covalent bond it would only donate one, this nitrogen is electron deficient. So this nitrogen has now got a positive charge. So this intermediate is not stable, and so another step has to occur in order to turn this into the product of our reaction. So a second ammonia gets involved. And this time our second ammonia does something very different. It takes one of the hydrogens off of the nitrogen. It doesn't matter which one. And essentially this lone pair will attack one of the hydrogens and then the electrons which are in the nitrogen to hydrogen bond will be passed back onto the nitrogen. Now if you consider that that bond there had an electron that bonded to the nitrogen and an electron that bonded to the hydrogen, or belonged to the hydrogen, if they're both going back to the nitrogen now, that will cancel out that positive charge. So we are now going to end up with our final product, which looks something like this. So our nitrogen is back to having three bonds like it should do. But the other ammonia, which has now taken that extra hydrogen, is now going to be sort of floating around as an ammonium ion, NH4+. Now, the reason why this is okay is because right back here at the beginning of the mechanism, we kicked off a Cl- ion. So that chloride will happily float around kind of associated with this ammonium ion and that together is our byproduct. So you can draw them both separately as an NH4 plus ion and a Cl minus ion, but you could also represent them as NH4 Cl ammonium chloride. Okay? Now okay so key other bits and pieces you may get asked about this uh, this process. So the reagent is ammonia and the nucleophile is ammonia. So that bit's relatively straightforward. In terms of the conditions, we've got to factor in that two lots of ammonia are needed in this process. And you could actually get asked, what are the roles of the ammonia molecules in this mechanism? So let's just quickly mention that. The first ammonia acts as the nucleophile. Uh, nucleophile. Um, just like how sodium hydroxide, the hydroxide ion and the, the cyanide ion come and attack the slightly positive carbon and kick off the halogen, that's what our first ammonia does in this process. So the first ammonia is acting as a nucleophile. The second ammonia is acting as a base. Now, if you remember your acid and base definitions from year 12, an acid is a proton donor, a base is a proton acceptor. And so this ammonia is taking this hydrogen off of the molecule and as such is acting as a base, 
okay? So the conditions, we either need to say excess ammonia or at least two equivalents. Two equivalents of NH3, okay? And then the final step is uh, the equation. So for the equation, we're going to start off with our halo alkane, so CH3, CH2, Cl. We're not just going to add ammonia, we're going to add two lots of ammonia, two lots of NH3. Our product is this, uh, this structure here, so it's going to be CH3, CH2, NH2, and then we have to factor in that ammonium chloride is our byproduct, so NH4Cl. Or like I mentioned, you could write it as NH4 plus and Cl minus. So it's that two equivalents of ammonia that uh, kind of stands out as being one of the key differences of this. Lastly, let's just talk about the name of the product. So it's two carbons all the way through, so we don't need to worry about our carbon chain length getting, in, uh, getting longer. Um, this is known as an amine functional group. So because we've got an amine on a two carbon chain, we would call this ethyl amine, okay? So ethyl amine is the product of this process. Right, have a go then at the following. So I'd like you to have a go at drawing out the nucleophilic substitution uh, mechanism using ammonia with chloromethane and with two bromopropane. Have a go at naming the product as well. This product is going to be a little bit trickier to name the second one. So pause the video clip and have a quick go at those. Right, so let's review these. So chloromethane is our starter material. Ammonia with its lone pair on the nitrogen. Our first two marks of our first two curly arrows there and there, carrying out the substitution step of our nucleophilic substitution. So this leads to our intermediate. Now, in an exam situation, this process, this whole question would be worth at least four marks. We've mentioned mark number one and mark number two. Mark number three is for the structure of this intermediate here. Now at the moment we don't have mark number three and that's because this nitrogen has to have a positive charge. So that's called a cation. So this is our cation intermediate. So mark number three we've now got for that structure. And then mark number four is for our second ammonia showing up and two curly arrows being used. So the first one attacks one of the three hydrogens, doesn't matter which one. The second arrow breaks this nitrogen to hydrogen bond and the arrow goes onto the nitrogen. So that gets you your fourth mark in that process. Let's just quickly jot down what our product would be. Our second ammonia ends up turning into NH4, and because this is a chlorine, NH4Cl, ammonium chloride, is our byproduct. Name of this, it's got one carbon, so it's methylamine. Okay, right, so the second example that I want you to have a go at, so two bromopropane, so meth, eth, prop, and our bromine is on carbon number two. So the mechanism is the same process. So our NH3 to start off with is gonna attack our slightly positive carbon, delta minus, delta plus. So arrow number one is mark number one. Arrow number two is mark number two. That results in the following intermediate forming. So NH, you might be able to hear my dog in the background sort of whimpering at the moment, but she loves nucleophilic substitution, so I don't know why she's moaning. 
So this is our carbocation intermediate. So because I've got that positive charge on the nitrogen, that is mark number three. And then mark number four is for our second ammonia showing up. And it takes one of those hydrogens off that nitrogen. So again, doesn't matter which one. Let's attack that one. And the electrons go onto the nitrogen. So that is mark number four. And that results in the following product. So our NH2 is on that middle carbon. And this time, this NH3 picks off this hydrogen, so it's going to become an NH4 plus ion. Because it was a bromide that was kicked off in the original step, rather than it being ammonium chloride, which we formed in this example, it's ammonium bromide, which is our byproduct here. Okay? Now, um, naming this product, I told you before that this functional group is called an amine which uh, which I've used in the name here, methylamine. Here's the issue. We can't use the uh, suffix uh, amine when it's attached to one of the carbons that isn't on the end of the chain. So if this NH2 group was attached on this end or this end, I'd call this meth -eth, I'd call it propylamine. But because this NH2 group is attached into the middle, I'm not going to use amine as the um, suffix of the name. I'm going to use amino as the prefix. So rather than putting amine at the end of the name, I could put amino at the beginning of the name. So for that reason, I'm going to call this 2 amino propane. Okay, so that's the name of that process, uh, the, the name of that product there. Right, final thing I'm going to mention before I uh, leave you to have a go at some of the tasks from the question pack is just to do with this step here. So I'm just going to redraw this for a second just to highlight one of the key errors that people make and make sure that you're in a position to avoid making this error because often the arrows in the second stage of this mechanism are done incorrectly. So... I'm just going to draw out this step uh, twice. I'm going to do it once correctly and the second time I'm going to do it incorrectly so you can make sure that you can look out for this. So remember when I said that the second ammonia comes along and it takes one of these three hydrogens. So the lone pair on that second ammonia needs to attack that hydrogen and the electrons go onto the nitrogen. What you do not do is draw your second ammonia with the arrow going on to the nitrogen and kicking off the hydrogen. Look at those arrows there. Look at those arrows there. Check you can see why these are different. So the arrow going to the hydrogen and then the electrons going onto the nitrogen, that is correct. Whereas the arrow going onto the nitrogen then kicking off the hydrogen is not correct, so make sure you look out for that. Okay, so having had a look through those examples, in your question packs now, you should be able to have a go at task number seven, you should be able to have a go at task number eight, and you should also be able to have a go at task number nine. Task nine re um, refers to a compound called hydrazine. You might need to Google what hydrazine looks like, but essentially uh, treat it as if it was ammonia. So that's the trick with this one. So imagine that hydrazine works in the same way that ammonia does in this reaction. Okay, so give these ones a go and see how you get on.